Darwin's Doubt, uh, number four. Well, it is supposed to advance. There we go. Um, Darwin's Doubt was written by uh, Steve Meyer. He's author of Signature in the Cell. He's an oil industry geophysicist before he became uh, interested in a science religion aspect. And uh, then he went and got his PhD in the philosophy of science from Cambridge, England. And he uh, is currently the director for the Center of Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute. And the book is actually a, an expansion, massive expansion of Meyer's article, The Origin of Biological Information in Higher Taxonomic Categories in the Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington. This is the article that got uh, Richard Sternberg in all the trouble he got into and it was retracted. It does not exist, um, even though, of course, it does. But that's how you deal with things that you can't argue with. You just make them go away. Uh, that's uh, what the cover of the book looks like. Uh, the book is divided into three main parts, and I'm actually quoting the prologue here. Part one, the mystery of the missing fossils. That's what we'll be finishing today. Part two, how to build an animal. Uh, discussing what you need to do to get an animal and whether Darwinism can get you there. And finally, part three, well, if Darwin isn't the answer, then what are you, where do you go? So that's the organization of the book. The story so far, uh, we've been through three of these uh, sessions. We've discussed the sudden appearance of multiple life forms in the Cambrian, which was a major unsolved problem for Darwin. And the problem has only gotten worse with the discovery of the Burgess Shale and then the Qingjiang fossils in China. The excuse that the precursors were soft-bodied and therefore not preserved has been refuted by the evidence, even though you will see it still used. Because they don't have another good answer, and so you can't just say, well, we don't know, and we, well, I guess you could say that, actually. And that's probably what they should say, but uh, then, of course, that means that they are people of faith, and that's not where they want to go. Claims that intermediates are really there are lacking evidence and not believed by most authorities. In other words, you'll hear this kind of urban legend kind of thing. Well, there really are those little critters that are uh, ancestors. But as he showed, not really. And uh, genetics seems to demand those intermediates if common descent is assumed, which raises the question, should we really assume common descent? Now, we start with the animal tree of life. And the reason we're going to start with it uh, now is because it is one of the counter arguments for the obvious missing fossils. In 2009, in honor of the bicentennial anniversary of Darwin's birth, a piece of artwork was created to adorn the ceiling of an exhibit room at the Natural History Museum in London. A uh, paper in the Journal of Archives of Natural History noted that the inspiration for the artwork titled Tree came from a diagram that Darwin had sketched in one of his notebooks, a diagram that later came to be known as the Tree of Life. And uh, we're going to see that figure in just a minute. One BBC radio program called The Tree Exhibit, the Darwinian Sistine Chapel. Painted on the ceiling, right? And it's the origin story. Uh, another article in Archives of Natural History, a journal published by the University of Edinburgh, remarked that tree celebrates Darwinian evolutionism and secular science and reason. It's almost uh, like it's a religion. And there's the drawing as passed down from uh, the Holy Father. For many biologists, the iconic image of Darwin's Tree of Life represents perhaps the single best distillation of what the science of evolutionary biology has to teach, namely the fact of evolution, apart from which nothing in biology makes sense. 
That's, of course, the references to Dobhansky, um, or Dobchansky. Uh, through, through the fossil though the fossil record does not directly attest to many of the expected <coughs> intermediate forms represented on Darwin's tree, it's, in other words, here's the problem, and here's how we're going to get around it. Leading authorities assert that other lines of evidence, uh, particularly from genetics, firmly establish Darwin's tree as the correct picture of the history of life. So they're saying, well, no, the fossil evidence isn't there, but here's other evidence that, that is more important than that, that trumps it. In the previous chapter, we saw that there are many good reasons to doubt the deep divergence hypothesis and its claim to have determined, based upon genetic evidence, the time at which the Cambrian ancest animals began to evolve from specific Precambrian ancestors. The tree of life as a whole, however, is another matter. Many evolutionary biologists think the case for universal common descent is somewhat something close to unassailable because, they argue, analysis of both an anatomical and genetic similarities converges on the same basic pattern of descent from a universal common ancestor. And as Richard Dawkins asserts, when we look comparatively at genetic sequences in all these different creatures, we find the same kind of hierarchical tree of resemblance. We find the same family tree, albeit much more thoroughly and convincingly laid out, as we did with the whole pattern of anatomical re resemblances throughout all the living kingdoms. You see, you do anatomy and it gives you a single tree. You do biochemistry or molecular biology if you prefer and it gives you a tree also, and the two trees match. And therefore, there must be something real about that tree. Likewise, Jerry Coyne argues that gene sequences independently confirm the same set of evolutionary relationships, the same basic tree established from the analysis of anatomy. Now, they're using kind of a little bit of weasel words there, the same basic um, the same kind of hierarchical tree of resemblance. <clears throat> but when you get to Peter Adkins, the weaseling is gone. Oxford University chemist Peter Adkins is even more emphatic. There is not a single instance of the molecular traces of change being inconsistent with our observations of whole organisms. Whoa! Well, as a result of this confidence, evolutionary biologists often dismiss the missing Precambrian fossil precursors and intermediates as a minor anomaly, one awaiting explanation by an otherwise completely adequate theory of the history of life. You see, we can't explain the fossils, but we've got everything else, so, um, you know, the fossils will come along sooner or later. Um, because most evolutionary biologists are confident that a single continuous tree with a single root best represents the history of life and explains so many other diverse factors, facts of biology, they continue to think the same tree-like pattern also accurately describes the Cambrian explosion and the pre-Cambrian history of animal life. Thus, although deep divergence studies do not establish the existence of pre-Cambrian animal ancestors for all the reasons argued in the previous chapter, the uncertainty surrounding the dates in these studies, and we don't know when they happened, but we do know that they happened. Um, has not, for most evolutionary biologists, undermined their confidence in the overall tree-like pattern of animal life. And in fact, you'll find, this is my own comments, of course, uh, this is the new talking point that you'll run into on the internet if you start discussing as that the um, reasonably educated Darwinists will say, well, look, why do, the nest, why do all organisms file, uh, form a nested hierarchy if evolution is false? Isn't that the, what evolution would be expected to do? And you don't expect creation to do it. And um, they'll, they'll say, for example, if you've got uh, you know, you've got a Lincoln and a Cadillac, they will have some of the same features in them that, let's say, Fords and Chevrolets do not. Even though the Cadillac and the Chevrolet will have some features that in, in common, 
you know, when you get to luxury, once uh, people start doing um, cell phones that uh, are, are um, cell phone integrated systems so that you can just speak, they come out in the more expensive models first and then they come out in the less expensive models later. See, design reuses designs from something that's totally unrelated. Um, whereas um, in, uh, in, the, in life, you don't see that kind of pattern. At least that's the claim. As a result of this confidence, evolutionary biologists often dismiss the missing Precambrian fossil precursors and intermediates as a minor anomaly, one awaiting explanation by an otherwise completely adequate theory of the history of life. So what Steve Meyer is going to do is going to, he's going to go after them where they're hiding. On the basis of similar logic, evolutionary biologists have typically assumed that what they think is true of all other forms of life is true of the Cambrian forms, that there must be a universal animal tree, the absence of fossil evidence and the conflicting results of deep divergent studies notwithstanding. To access the other evidence from genetics that supports this conclusion, it's useful to review how the case for universal animal tree, the universal animal tree is similar to the deep divergence hypothesis and also how it is different. Um, and uh, the, the similarities I'm going to leave out, I'm just going to give you the differences. Uh, unlike deep divergence studies, however, which attempt to establish just a single divergence time, such as that of the common ancestor of all the animal phyla, these more detailed phylogenetic studies seek to establish the contours of the Precambrian tree of animal life. Which ones branch from which ones first? Investigators employ these methods even in the absence of corroborating fossil evidence. In his textbook on fossils and evolution, following a full page depiction of the discon discontinuous appearance of the Cambrian animals in the fossil record, Occidental College geologist Donald Prothero explains, if the fossil record is poor in one particular group, we look to other sources of data. He concludes that, notice the fossil record is poor. Um, nothing about maybe the, the theory isn't supported by the fossil record, <laughs> which is really what they're saying. Uh, he concludes that two such sources of data anatomical and molecular data now converge on a common ancestor, uh, answer, one that is almost certainly the truth, as much as we can use that term in science. So here's somebody who's saying all these studies converge, just like our other three people that he quoted and many other people whom he didn't quote will say. But is all of this true? Does analysis of the genetic and anatomical similarity of the Cambrian animals really establish that the history of animal life is best depicted as a continually, continuously branching tree. Does the pattern of a branching tree accurately depict the history of the Precambrian Cambrian animal life and in so doing establish the existence of Precambrian forms that the fossil record fails to document? Well, that's the question we're going to go after. A widely used textbook on phylogenetic methods explains this. The fact that there is only one tree provides the basis for testing alternative hypotheses. If two hypotheses are generated for the same group of species, then we conclude at least one of these hypotheses is false. Of course, it is possible that both are false and some other tree is true. And I want you to notice that he left out. And of course, it is possible that both are false and there is really no tree. But he didn't say that. Uh, but does the evidence for a Precambrian animal tree of life fall similarly into place or does it generate multiple conflict conflicting histories? We've already seen that the fossil evidence does not point to a specific Precambrian tree of animal life or perhaps to any tree at all. We've also seen that the genetic evidence by itself does not establish a single divergence point for animal evolution. But what about the genetic and anatomical evidence taken together? Well, does that con uh, evidence converge on a single history of animal life? If so, then it could well make up for lack of fossil evidence. Otherwise, it would seem to raise an obvious question. Are the observed genetic and anatomical affinities among the Cambrian phyla sending reliable historical signals at all? So, and now he's going to talk about conflicting histories. And he's going to give three reasons, or three sets of reasons. 
There are several reasons to doubt that evidence of genetic and anatomical similarity is sending a reliable signal of the early history of animal life. First, comparisons of different molecules frequently generate different trees. Divergent trees. Second, comparisons of anatomical characteristics and molecules frequently pr produce different divergent trees. Third, trees based solely on different anatomical characteristics often contradict each other. He's going to say the whole thing is a mess. All three logical parts of it. Let's examine each problem. Okay, molecules versus molecules. This is, there are different genetic trees. Just as the molecular data do not point unequivocally to a single date for the last common ancestor of all the Cambrian animals, the point of deep divergence, they do not point unequivocally to a single coherent tree depicting the evolution of animals in the Precambrian. Numerous papers have noted the prevalence of contradictory trees based on evidence from molecular genetics. Here's an example, a 2009 paper in Trends in Ecology and Evolution. Notice that this is the peer-reviewed literature. Is notes that evolutionary trees from different genes often have conflicting branching patterns. Oops. Likewise, the paper in Biological Reviews acknowledges that phylogenetic conflict is common and frequently the norm rather than the exception. Echoing these views, a January 2009 cover story in review article in New Scientist observes that today the Tree of Life project, quote, lies in tatters, torn to pieces by an onslaught of negative evidence. Well, that doesn't sound like there is no conflicting evidence, does it? Sounds like Adkins was overstating it slightly. As the article explains, many biologists now argue that the tree concept is obsolete and needs to be discarded. Whoa. Because the evidence suggests that the evolution of animals and plants isn't exactly tree-like. The New Scientist article cited a study by Michael Sivanen, a biologist at the University of California, Davis, who studied the relationships among the several phyla that first arose in the Cambrian. Sivanen's study compared 2,000 genes in six animal, 2,000 different genes in six animals, spanning phyla as diverse as chordates, echinoderms, arthropods, and nematodes. His analysis yielded no consistent tree-like pattern. As the new scientist reported in theory, he should have been able to use the gene sequences to construct an evolutionary tree, showing the relationship between the six animals. He failed. The problem was that the different genes told contradictory evolutionary studies, or stories. Sivanen himself summarized the results in the bluntest of terms. We've just annihilated the tree of life. It's not a tree anymore. It's a different topology. Entirely. What would Darwin have made of that? Other studies. And they uh, again, this is the Reader's Digest version because I can't read the whole thing. Have encountered similar difficulties. Vanderbilt University molecular system systematist Antonis Rokas concedes that a complete and accurate tree of life remains an elusive goal. In 2005, eventually co-published in Science, Rokas, uh, analyzing 50 genes across 17 taxa, and his team reported that a 50 gene data matrix does not resolve relationships among the most metazoan phyla. In other words, it's not even a 49 to 1 or 47 to 3. It's you can't resolve it. Some go here, some go there. Because it generated numerous conflicting phylogenies and historical signals. Despite the amount of data and breadth of taxa analyzed, relationships among most metazoan phyla remain unresolved. In a paper published the following year, Rokas and University of Wisconsin at Madison biologist Sean Carroll went so far as to assert that certain critical parts of the tree of life may be difficult to resolve regardless of the quantity of conventional data available. 
It's not going to be solved by more data. This problem applies specifically to the relationships of the animal phyla, where many recent studies have report, reported support for many alternative conflicting phylogenies. We're going to see one of those in a little bit uh, based on anatomy, and I think it'll be easier to see the kind of problems that you run into. Investigators studying the animal tree found that a large fraction of single genes produced phylogenies of poor quality, such that in one case, a study omitted 35% of single genes from their data matrix because those genes produced phylogenies at odds with conventional wisdom. Well, that's one way to deal with conflicting data, just don't use it. Uh, Rokas and Carroll tried to explain the many contradictory trees by proposing that the animal phyla, watch this closely, might have evolved too quickly for the genes to record some signal of phylogenetic relationships into the respective genomes. Um, in other words, the Cambrian explosion was real. That's one way of resolving it. In their view, if, evolutionary, if the evolutionary process responsible for anatomical novelty works quickly enough, anybody can say slow, gradual process, there would not be sufficient time for differences to accumulate in key molecular markers, in particular those used to infer evolutionary relationships into different animal phyla. Then, given enough time, whatever signal did exist might become lost. Thus, when groups of organisms branch rapidly and then evolve separately for long periods of time, this can overwhelm the true historical signal, leading to the inability to determine evolutionary relationships. Where's the data? Interesting theory, no? Where's the data to support this? Um, well, it would be in the, in the article that was cited, which is uh, footnote 21. So, you have to read the article, uh, but it's there. All right, take it back, well, 22. Their article brings the discussion of the Cambrian explosion full circle from an attempt to use genes to compensate for the absence of fossil evidence to the acknowledgement that genes do not convey any clear signal about the evolutionary relationships of the phyla pres preserved by fossils in the Cambrian. The logic of their analysis also leads them to a strangely familiar conclusion. Since the analysis of key genetic markers, like the genes tracked in molecular clock studies that presumably accumulate mutations at a constant rate, show a low number of mutational differences between the Cambrian animal phyla, Rokas and Carroll conclude from specifically genetic evidence that phyla must have diverged rapidly. As they put it in another paper, Inferences from these two independent lines of evidence, molecules and fossils, support a view of the origin of metazoa as a radiation compressed in time. <laughs> Just trying to deal with the data. Thus, the inability to reconstruct the evolutionary history of the animal phyla from the molecular data not only fails to establish a Precambrian pattern of descent, it ironically also reaffirms the extreme rapidity of the origin of the Cambrian animal forms. And now, that's molecules versus molecules. This is molecules versus anatomy. I should have had that italicized. Um, studies of molecular homologies often fail to confirm evolutionary trees depicting the history of the animal phyla derived from studies of comparative anatomy. Instead, during the 1990s, early into the revolution in molecular genetics, many studies began to show that phylogenetic trees derived from anatomy and those derived from molecules often contradicted each other. Probably the most protracted conflict of this type con uh, concerns a widely accepted phylogeny for the bilaterian animals, animals with a uh, plane of symmetry down the middle and no other planes. This classification scheme was originally the work of the influential American zoologist Libby Hyman. Hyman's view, generally known as the Colomata, actually it's, um, uh, it's from the Greek koilas, so it's uh, 
some people will call that coelomata hypothesis, was based on her analysis of anatomical characteristics, mainly germ or primary tissue layers, planes of body symmetry, and especially the presence or absence of a central cavity called the coelom, which gives the hypothesis its name. In the coelomata hypothesis, the bilaterian animals were classified in three groups. A coelomata, they don't have one, the pseudo-solomata, which have one that's not formed in, in uh, the vertebrate way, and the solomata, which is formed in the standard way that uh, vertebras are formed, each encompassing several different bilaterian animal phyla. And uh, here's, the, here's the problem that you run into. Now, the traditional way of saying it would be that the nematodes branched off first, and then the arthropods and the vertebrates both have a, a coelom. Um, but what that means is, that as it turns out, you have to have molting and 18 sRNA uh, behaving in a particular way have arisen twice, once after the uh, uh, nematodes branched off, and then once after the arthropods branched off, because the vertebrates don't have it. Um, on the other hand, that's the Salomata hypothesis, and this is the ecdysosa hypothesis, where molting and the 18 sRNA actually uh, put the arthropods and the nematodes together, and the coelom developed separately in both. Now, which one is the homology inherited from a common ancestor, and which one is the homoplasy, which is the misleading similarity? You get to decide. Then in the mid-1990s, a very different arrangement of these animal groups was proposed based on the analysis of molecule present in each, the 18S ribosomal RNA. The team of researchers who proposed this arrangement published a groundbreaking paper in Nature with a title that surprised many morphologists. Evidence, is for, evidence for a clade of nematodes, arthropods, and other molting animals. Those animals that get rid of an exoskeleton. The Nature paper explained how unexpected this grouping of arthropods and nematodes was. Considering the greatly differing morphologies, embryological features, and life histories of the molting animals, it was initially surprising that the ribosomal RNA tree should group them together. My point in summarizing these disputes is simply to note that the molecular and anatomical data commonly disagree, that one can find partisans on every side, and that the debate is persisting and ongoing, persistent and ongoing. And therefore, the statements of Dawkins, Coyne, Adkins, and many others about all this evidence, molecular and anatomical, supporting a single unambiguous animal tree are manifestly false. As can be readily seen by the comparison figure of 61A and 61B, these hypotheses, colomata and dysozoa, contradict each other. Although both might be false, both cannot be true. Varying papers analyzing other groups have found similar discrepancies between molecular and morphological versions of the animal tree. A paper by Laura Maley and Charles Marshall in the journal Science noted animal relationships derived from these new molecular data sometimes are very different from those implied by older classical evaluations of morphology. For example, when tarantulas were used as representative arthropods, the arthropods were grouped more closely to mollusks than to deuterostomes. That's, uh, deuterostomes are, are, among other things, uh, vertebrates. Um, the deuterostomes developed the anus is first and the mouth later, the mouth second, whereas the uh, protostomes de develop the mouth first and then the anus second. This makes sense because both mo mollusks and arthropods are protostomes, animals 
But when the brain shrimp were used as the representative of the arthropod instead of the tarantula, the arthropods became the odd man out. Now mollusks were grouped with mo most closely with deuterostomes, far away from the arthropods, a result clearly at odds with the conventional phylogeny based on, upon animal anatomical characteristics. Examples of similar conflict abound. The traditional phylogeny places place sponges at the bottom of the animal tree with progressively more complex phyla. Uh, Cnidarians, flatworms, nematodes branching off. But Valentine, Jablonski, and Irwin noted that molecules indicate a very different configuration of the tree. Where some higher deuterostome phyla branched off very early and some comparatively less complex phyla branched off very late. As a major review article in Nature in 2000 observes, evolutionary trees constructed by studying biological molecules don't resemble those drawn up from morphology. And the problem isn't getting better over time. A 2012 paper admits that larger data sets are not solving this problem. Incongruence between phylo phylogenies derived from morphological versus molecular analysis and between trees based on different subsets of molecular sequences has become pervasive as data sets have expanded rapidly in both character and species. So those, uh, those disagreements are just all over the place. As Jeffrey Schwartz and Bruno Maresca put it in the journal Biological Theory, again, this is peer-reviewed literature, this assumption derives from interpreting molecular similarity or dissimilarity between taxa in context of a Darwinian model of continuum and gradual change. Review of the history of molecular systematics and its claims in the context of molecular biology reveals that there is no bas basis for the molecular assumption. That's the assumption that the molecules will match the anatomy tree. And then there is actually anatomy versus anatomy, some parts of anatomy that have been ignored. Biologists find that there are only a handful of highly abstract characters, such as radial versus bilateral body symmetry, the number of fundamental tissue layers, tri triploblasty, three layers versus diploblasty, two layers, or the type of body cavity present, true coelom or coelom, uh, pseudocoelom or no coelom, available for morphological comparisons of the many diverse animal forms. Yet evolutionary biologists have often disputed the validity of these rather abstract traits as guides to evolutionary history. For example, the standard version of the animal tree, based on, upon anatomy, groups animals according to their style of body plan symmetry and by their mode of body plan development. As noted earlier, animals with mirror symmetry along their vertical head to tail axes all fall within the bilaterian group. Animals with radial symmetry or no symmetry fall outside this group. Sea anemones, for example, are not bilateral animals. Within the bilateria, Taxonomists distinguish other main groups, protostomes and deuterostomes, based upon their differing modes of body plan development, that is, either mouth first or anus first. Animals have two main ways of generating germ cells. In one mode of germ cell formation, known as preformation, cells inherit internal signals from a region within their own cell structures to become germ cells. They're just, they're picked out ahead of time. Um, in the other main way of generating germ cells, known as epigenesis, germ cells receive external signals from surrounding tissues to become primordial germ cells. And uh, we're going to show a figure that may make it a little bit easier to see. In the preformation, um, the cells uh, simply migrate up in the, uh, in, let's see, the epigenesis. Um, there are cells that, that trigger it. Okay, so the motive, it, it, the details of exactly how that happens are not terribly important for the argument. What's important is that you have two different ways of, of doing this. The model germ cell theory formation is nearly randomly distributed among the different animal groups, make it in, in, making it impossible to generate a coherent tree based on this characteristic let alone making any tree, any comparison between such a tree and the canonical tree. Note also the distribution of the two basic modes of germ cell development within the animal phyla as depicted on the canonical tree. And that's what you get. And you can see that epigenesis accounts for a lot of 
um, phyla, but you can see that preformation accounts for a lot of phyla, and you can see that they're not lined up with how the supposed tree of life is supposed to have originated. And there are some um, animals, arthropods being one of them, and flatworms, annelids, mollusks, that have some parts are some animals that do one way and some animals that do another way. So what you've got is a totally mixed up um, you can't make that into a tree. And certainly if you tried, the tree would not look like the tree on the other side, which is a more or less traditional. In fact, some people have collected all, all kinds of different trees and as you can see, they're highly varied, to say the least. The one I like best is the one at the bottom, where they all come out separately from the protista. That's probably closest to the truth. <laughs> After completing a survey of many such difficulties, University of St. Andrews zoologist Pat Wilmer and Oxford University zoologist Peter Holland, experts on invertebrate anatomy, draw this conclusion. Taken together, modern reevaluations of traditional evidence support different and mutually exclusive subsets, <coughs> excuse me, subsets of um, phylogenetic relations. They go on to observe that <coughs> patterns of symmetry the number of germ cell layers in the body, <coughs> the nature of the body cavity, and the presence or type of serial repetition. <coughs> I'm going to have to get some water here in a minute. Excuse me. <coughs> Let's try that again. <coughs> After completing a survey of many such difficulties, the University of St. Andrews zoologist Pat Wilmer and Oxford University zoologist Peter Holland <laughs> experts on invertebrate anatomy draw this conclusion. Taken together, modern reevaluations of traditional evidence support different and mutually exclusive subsets of phylogenetic relations. They go on to observe that patterns of symmetry, the number of germ cell layers in the body, <coughs> the nature of the body cavity, and the presence or type of serial repetition or segmentation, have all been used to infer common ancestry. But they explain the phylogenetic story of these characteristics is itself uh, tell is now either unacceptable or at least controversial because the data are at best inconsistent. And again, <clears throat> if you want to look these up, he's got all the references. The assumption of phylogenetic interference or inference. All of these problems underscored several fundamental difficulties with the methods of phylogenetic reconstruction. When biologists analyze multiple anatomical traits or genes, the animal phyla are cons consistently defy attempts to arrange them into the pattern of a single tree. Yet if there was a period of hidden Precambrian evolution, and if comparative sequence analysis revealed the actual history of animal life, and by implication the existence of Precambrian animal forms, phylogenetic studies should converge more and more around a single tree, uh, tree of animal life, but it doesn't. One could argue that these conflicting trees do at least show that some tree life evolutionary pattern of common ancestry preceded the Cambrian, since all conflicting trees do affirm that. But again, they all show that because they all presuppose it. They ask, what kind of a tree do you have rather than, is there a tree? And of course, if you ask what kind of a tree you have, you're going to get a tree. You just are. The repeated need to posit convergent evolution and other related mechanisms cast further doubt on the method of phylogenetic reconstruction. Invoking convergent evolution, or homoplasy if you like, negates the very logic of the arguments from homology, which confirms that similarity implies common ancestry. 
except, we now learn, in those many, many cases when it does not. And of course, the ultimate solution for this is, well, there's been horizontal gene transfer. And then how do you get a tree of life at all at that point? He talks about a family reunion. I'm going to skip over that part. Uh, it's interesting, but probably not totally central. But if the genes don't tell the story of Precambrian ancestral forms, if they don't compensate for a dearth of fossil evidence and establish a univocal, long, cryptic history of animal life from an original animal, an er metazoan, er being um, German for original, then logically we are back to taking the fossil record at face value. In that case, the mystery of the missing ancestral fossils remains. If so, is there any way to explain the abrupt appearance of new forms of life in the fossil record within an evolutionary framework? During the 1970s, two young paleontologists thought that there just might be a way to do exactly that. And now we transition into punctuated equilibrium. <coughs> Again, we're not going to read the whole thing. Uh, there will be places where we skip. I try to put ellipses there in most of the places where we do skip. Niels Eldridge, one day while standing in a Michigan laundromat, following months of collecting trilobite fossils for his PhD research, Eldridge happened to reach into his pocket. He removed one of the fossils he'd been collecting, a specimen of a trilobite species called Phacops rana. Initially, as he examined the specimen, he felt depressed. The fossil closely resembled many others that he had found across the layers of strata during his field work in the Midwest. His trilobites showed no evidence of gradual change, as classical neo-Darwinism had taught him to expect. As Eldridge explained in a lecture at the University of Pittsburgh in 1983, he then experienced a kind of scientific epiphany. He realized that the absence of change itself was a very interesting pattern, or as he later put it, status, or stasis is data. In other words, they don't change. Guess what? That's the news. They don't change rather than, why don't they change when Darwinism says they should? So he's saying, well, accept the, the data at face value. You know, I'm all for that kind of thing. Stasis is the term that Eldridge and his scientific collator, uh, collaborator, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, I'm skipping figure 7-1, later gave to the pattern in which most species during their geological history either do not change in any appreciable way or else they fluctuate mildly in morphology. In other words, as you go up the fossil record, actually, uh, they either give you a straight line with no deviations or perhaps a little movement here and a little movement back and always centering around the same thing with no apparent direction. They don't head off as the tree of life that you saw earlier showed. As Eldridge examined that solitary trilobite, he realized that he'd been observing evidence of stasis for some time, however much he might have wanted it otherwise. As he explained, stasis was by far the most important pattern to have emerged from all of my staring at fake up specimens. They all look the same. He continued, traditionally seen as an artifact of a poor record, as the inability of paleontologists to find what evolutionary biologists going back to Darwin had told them must be there, stasis was, as Stephen J. Gould put it, uh, paleontology's trade secret. An embarrassing one at that. Now remember, those are uh, Eldridge's words. An embarrassing one at that. Not Steve Myers or mine. This embarrassing realization proved pivotal, eventually leading Eldridge and Gould to reject both the gradualistic pattern of evolutionary change articulated by Darwin and the neo-Darwinian understanding of the mechanism by which such change allegedly takes place. It also led them to formulate in a series of scientific papers from 1972 to 1980 a new theory of evolution known as punctuated equilibrium, or punk -eek for short. Rather than natural selection favoring the fittest individual organisms within a species, as it does in classical Darwinism and neo-Darwinism, these paleontologists proposed that it often selected the most fit species among a group of competing species. 
<coughs> because they thought that speciation occurred more rapidly, and because they thought that natural selection acted on whole species and not just individual organisms, the advocates of punctuated equilibrium theorized that morphological change typically occurred in larger, more discrete jumps than Darwin first envisioned. During the 1970s and 80s, the theory of punctuated equilibrium, or punk -eek, as it is affectionately known, generated both intense scientific debates and extensive media coverage. Critics called the model evolution by jerks, uh, which is, of course, a pun, uh, leading Gould to reply that the proponents of gradualism were offering evolution by creeps. <laughs> Though initially Eldridge played more of a role than uh, of in formulating the theory, Stephen Jay Gould emerged as leading spokesman for it. In typically large populations of organisms, it is difficult for a newly arising genetic trait to spread throughout an entire population. Yet for any evolutionary change to occur in a population, new genetic traits must become widespread, or fixed as it's called, by a process called fixation. In smaller populations, however, the probability of a new arising trait becomes, becoming fixed is much higher, since the new trait needs to spread to fewer organisms. If it's just two organisms that make it over the mountains, a male and a female, and they both have the uh, new trait, then the, then, the, uh, uh, then the trait is already fixed right there without having to go through any more complicated uh, 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 genetic variation. In formulating punctuated equilibrium, Gould realized that new species would inevitably have to be arise in smaller populations where random processes could have a greater chance of fixing traits. Prominent among these random processes is one called genetic drift. This occurs when genetic changes spread or disappear randomly through a population without regard of their effect on survival and reproduction. And so this is not neo-Darwinism. Gould, Eldridge, and Stanley, who's another early advocate of this, thought that members of these siblings or offspring species would, subsequent to their origin, by allopatric speciation, that's the process of separating out a few, and uh, compete against each other for resources and survival, just as in neo-Darwinism, individual organisms or siblings may compete to survive and reproduce within a population. In their view, if members of one species succeed over another because of some selective advantages they possess, then that species will survive and predominate, passing on its traits. This process of interspecies or interpopulation competition, as opposed to intraspecies competition, Gould called species selection. Well, what about the fossil record? <coughs> Eldridge and Gould devised the theory of punctuated equilibrium to eliminate conflict between the fossil record and evolutionary theory. Uh, stasis is data, you have to deal with stasis and you have to account for it. Nevertheless, punctuated equilibrium has its own problems accounted for the fossil record in particular. Now notice it does, it does an okay job for some of it, but the Cambrian explosion. The pattern of fossil appearance in the Cambrian period is inconsistent with both the way in which punctuated equilibrium depicts the history of life and the idea that allopatric speciation and species selection are responsible for that pattern. There are several reasons for this. First, the top-down pattern of appearance of Cambrian animal forms that if, you know, there's a form over here and there's a form like it, uh, uh, completely unlike it over here. Uh, the difference between a starfish and a trilobite, for example. Um, contradicted punctuated equilibrium's depiction of the history of life almost as much. So it allows for little jumps, but not for big ones as it does the Darwinian picture. Recall that Darwin thought that the first representatives of the higher taxonomic categories emerged after the first appearance of representatives of the lower taxonomic. The tree gradually goes apart, but here you have things that just kind of come up with no, uh, no evidence of ancestors. The small differences uh, distinguishing, for example, one species from another should gradually accumulate until they produce organisms different enough to be classified first as different genera, then as different families, eventually as different orders, classes, and so on. 
Instead, the first Cambrian animals forms are different enough to, from each other to justify classing them as separate classes, subphyla and phyla, from their first appearance in the fossil record. I don't know if I collected I don't think I put that in. Second, for species selection to produce many new species, such as those of the rise in the Cambrian explosion, a large pool of different species must first exist. Because what happens is you have the variation inside the, the species, and then you select um, something at the side that's been accumulating variations even while producing a relatively hom homogeneous um, fossil pool. The Precambrian fossil record does not document, however, the existence of such a large and diverse pool of competing Precambrian species upon which species selection might operate. See, you, don't ha you need a big population in order to get all those variations. Paleontologists Douglas Irwin and James Valentine exposed the problem in 1987, a long time ago, in a paper entitled Interpreting, the uh, Great, Interpreting Great Developmental Experiments, the Fossil Record. They, they questioned the ability of both the main evolutionary theories of the time, the punctuated equilibrium and neo-Darwinism, to explain the pattern of fossil appearance in the Precambrian-Cambrian fossil record. Clearly, neo-Darwinism does not explain this pattern. They've, the book's been all about that. But as Valentine and Irwin argue, neither does punctuated equilibrium. As they conclude, the mechanism of species selection requires a large pool of species upon which to act, which aren't in the Precambrian. Thus, Valentine and Irwin conclude, the probability that species selection is a general solution to the origin of higher taxa is not great. That's a polite way of saying it ain't going to happen. At the same time, he recognized that these new traits would have a far greater chance of being fixed into small isolated populations where the random loss of some trait makes the fixation of others more likely. Uh, he's recalling a, an example he gave in the book that we skipped over. By relying on large populations to generate new traits and small populations to fix them through, uh, throughout a population, Gould wanted to provide both a plausible, if finely tuned, mechanism to explain both macroevolutionary change and the absence of fossil intermediates. But by relying on the accumulation of new traits within large po apparent populations, Gould undercut his own rationale for concluding that fossil records should not preserve many intermediate forms. The reason for this is obvious. If novel genetic traits arise and spread within a large population of organisms, they are more likely to leave behind fossil evidence of their existence. In other words, this whole thing doesn't explain a, a uniform population. What it should do is give you a tree that's completely filled in, so to speak, or a wedge, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, and, uh Contradictory here is that you still have to have that species. You have to have the species. Where did that come from? Well, yes, um, obviously this is not a solution to a number of different problems, the origin of life being one of them, but apparently the Cambrian explosion being another. Organisms with new and unique combinations or mosaics of traits represent nothing less than new forms of life. So. Like I say, what you should see is instead of a nice narrow, which is what you see with stasis, you should see a gradually spreading uh, tree uh, or with filled in on the inside until something breaks off on the outside. And thus the process by which Gould envisions new genetic traits arising in large populations implies that new forms of life, some presumably transitional to other forms, should be preserved in the fossil record. Yet the Precambrian fossil record fails to preserve such a wealth of biological experiments during the long period of relative stability in large populations that Gould's theory envisions, and I might say requires. Foote observed that for punctuated equilibrium to succeed as a, an explanation for the data of the fossil record, it needs a mechanism capable of producing major evolutionary change quickly, because only such fast-acting change could account for the relative paucity of transitional forms in the fossil record. As Foote explained, writing with Gould, in fact, the 
Adequacy of punctuated equilibrium as an account of the fossil record depends on the existence of a mechanism of unusual speed and flexibility. They need evolution to really take off. Many biologists have concluded that allopatric speciation requires too much change too quickly to provide the theory of punctuated equilibrium with a biologically plausible mechanism for producing new traits or forms of life. At least not without some help, shall we say? And that is why Gould and Eldridge, especially in their later formulations of the theory, envisioned new traits arising during long periods of stasis in larger populations rather than during short bursts of speciation. But a process which, in which traits arise during long periods of stasis does not cons constitute a mechanism of unusual speed and flexibility, though that is precisely what, according to Golden Foot, punctuated equilibrium requires in order to explain the abrupt appearance of new animal forms. They need it, they don't have it. Is if allopatric speciation does not produce a fast acting gene uh, trait generating mechanism, does species selection? Again, the answer is no. Species selection eliminates less fit species in a competition for survival. It does not generate the traits that distinguish species and establish the basis for interspecies competition. So where do these traits come from? When pressed, Gould eventually acknowledged that the origin of anatomical traits themselves result from good old-fashioned natural selection acting on random mutations and variations. That is, from the neo-Darwinian mechanism acting over long periods of time on relatively stable, larger, relatively stable populations. But that means that punctuated equilibrium, to the extent it relies on mutation and natural selection, is subject to the same evidential and theoretical problems as neo-Darwinism. It's just neo-Darwinism with a different dress on. And uh, can we say neo-Darwinism in a lab coat? Um, and one of those problems is that neo-Darwinian neo mechanism does not act quickly enough to account for the explosive appearance of new fossil forms in the Cambrian period. An even more profound difficulty with punctuated equilibrium is an explanation for the Cambrian explosion remains. Neither species selection nor allopatric species speciation explains the origin of the representatives of the higher taxonomic categories, that is, the new animals representing new phyla and classes. Remember, that's what we have to account for in the uh, Cambrian explosion. And neither mechanism accounts, for example, for the origin of the compound eye of a trilobite, or the gills of Cambrian fish, or the echinoderm body plan. Ma many critics of punctuated equilibrium have noted this problem. Remember Richard Dawkins, what we have to explain is this, these things that look designed what I mainly want is a th complex. Uh, part of what I mainly want a theory of evolution to do is to explain complex, well-designed mechanisms like hearts, hands, eyes, and echolocation. Nobody, not even the most ardent species selectionists, think that species selection can do that. Yet Gould and Eldridge, at least initially, advanced punctuated equilibrium as a bold new theory of evolutionary biology, giving the impression that it provided an ambitious solution to the problem of macroevolution and by implications of events such as the Cambrian explosion. Gould was no less radical in a, in a widely cited 1980 paper in, his, in the journal Paleobiology, in which he offered punctuated equilibrium as a new and general theory of evolution. There he also famously declared the synthetic theory of neo-Darwinism, which remember his theory depends on, as effectively dead despite its persistence as textbook orthodoxy. Sometimes you eat your words, I guess. Mm -hmm. Only after critics exposed punctuated equilibrium for lacking an adequate mechanism did Gould retreat to a more conservative formulation of the theory, making its reliance upon the neo-Darwinian mechanism explicit. From the early 1980s until his death in 2002, Gould made a series of concessions in particular about the inadequacy of speciation and species selection as mechanisms for generating complex adaptations. No wonder then that leading Cambrian paleontologists such as James Valentine and Douglas Irwin concluded in 1987 that neither of the contending theories of evolutionary change at the species level, phyletic gradualism or punctuated equilibrium, seem applicable to explaining the origin of new body plants. Thus, though the theory of punctuated equilibrium was initially presented as a solution to the mysterious and sudden origin of animal forms, 
Uh, upon closer inspection, inspection, it failed to offer such a solution. Can the neo-Darwinian uh, mechanism of natural selection acting on random mutations build new forms of animal life with other complex adaptations? If so, is it possible that it could do this in the brief time allowed by the fossil record? If not, is it reasonable to think it could build new forms of animal life if only more time were available? If so, how much time would the Darwinian mechanism need to build complex adaptations and new forms of animal life? In the next several chapters, this is part two now that we'll be getting into next week. I will address these fundamental questions at the heart of the Cambrian mystery, questions in brief about how to build an animal. Now, I'm going to come back to you. You remember we have been pulling this famous Dawkins quote that's been used any number of times. We're we have been giving the context that Dawkins wanted us to give, but I'm going to give another context. This is actually in a chapter criticizing punctuated equilibrium. And he says, Eldridge and Gould certainly would agree that some very important gaps really are due to imperfections in the fossil record. And the fossil record doesn't show what either punctuated equilibrium or standard neo-Darwinian evolution would expect. Very big gaps, too. For example, the Cambrian strata of rocks, vintage about 600 million years, are the oldest ones in which we find most of the major invertebrate groups. And we find many of them already in an advanced state of evolution the very first time they appear. It is though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. That's the evidence. Needless to say, this appearance of sudden planting has delighted creationists. Now, of course, he says, you can't stop there. So we have to give the full context, so we will. Evolutionists of all stripes believe, of all stripes, Eldridge, Gould, himself, and everybody in between and around, that this re really does represent a very large gap in the fossil record, a gap that is simply due to the fact that for some reason very few fossils have lasted from periods before about 600 million years ago. In other words, there have to be animals there. We can't see them, but they have to be there. One good reason might be that many of these animals had only soft parts to their bodies, no shells or bones to fossilize. If you are a creationist, you may think that this is special pleading. Um, well, yeah, I think that's reasonable to conclude. Um, remember, They've got to be there, even though we can't see them. <laughs> now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I, I think Dawkins has faith. But I will now leave it to your comments. Uh, for what it's worth, I've gone over the hour, so I know if some of you need to leave. Uh, uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, can you? Oh, okay. you've got it already. All right. Uh, I have a question regar regar regarding the development of the theory of uh, punctuated equilibrium. Mayer attributes Gould and Eldridge to the development of this theory. But uh, my question is, where, where do you place the contribution of uh, French philosopher Teilhard de Chardin. In other words, uh, my understanding is that uh, he is the one who came up with this uh, punctuated equilibrium. And he, he lived, I think, before, before uh, uh, Gould and Eldridge. Am I wrong? Um, to my knowledge, uh, punctuated equilibrium was not something that Teilhard de, de Chardin came up with. I may be wrong on that, mm -hmm. but Gould and Elbridge have never uh, acknowledged a, uh, a contribution by him. Um, I have not seen 
anybody who's running the history of, e of either Goulder and, and Eldridge or, um, or Taylor de, de Chardin himself. I, I've run into him because of the theological implications. Uh, and he's, he's occasionally mentioned in theology, but his contribution to science has largely been forgotten. And in fact, I think he's an embarrassment because he was fairly closely associated with P Piltdown Man. Were they contemporaneous? What? Taylor de Chardin well, and Gould? Well, Piltdown Man goes well before the career of, uh, of uh, Gould and Eldridge. So in terms of time, he would have come up with something, whatever he came up with, earlier than um, earlier than Golden Eldridge. But my sense is that what he really did was try to make a um, make a theological argument, which was, I think, later rejected by uh, uh, the Catholic uh, hierarchy. The reason I'm asking this is because I took a course in philosophy back in the 60s. And I had to study Thillard de Chardin and his theory. And uh, Gould, uh, I mean, uh, uh, according to Mayer, developed this theory in the 70s. So evidently Thillard de Chardin preceded Gould, but he is not given any credit for this. Well. I will have to say that I don't have enough knowledge to definitively say that he didn't come up with it. Um, but the, my sense is that he didn't, and if you have more information, I may have to look at that. Thank you. Gould, Gould may not, uh, Eldridge, uh, may not have felt very much sympathy to Tillyard de Chardin simply because uh, he's more, Tillyard is more of a deist. And these were uh, complete naturalists, we might state, and so uh, they may not have quite felt in the same camp uh, because of that major basic, major basic difference in the thinking of the two. Uh, the uh, the thing that strikes me, you know, it's not just the Cambrian explosion. We got the Avalon explosion for the Ediacaran. We've got the explosion of the mammals uh, and the explosion of the birds up in the uh, Eocene. Uh, and it, uh, it seems to me that uh, it's really, uh, it's not just the Cambrian explosion, it's much more than that, but uh, wherever major groups appear, you don't seem to find the ancestors. And uh, to rely on allopatric uh, isolation, I, you know, this is, uh, how much of this goes on right now? I mean, we're talking about animals that can move around. Uh, <laughs> going to separate them out by allopatric accidents. Uh, can you do that for a million different species? Well, I think that Dawkins uh, put, uh, put his finger on the real problem, and that is that what evolution has to explain is not just that there are different animals. It's there are animals with what look like finely tuned uh, senses, um, digestive capabilities, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, means of locomotion. Um, and traditional, you know, Darwin's mm. big success, such as it was, was the ability to explain that you look at an eye and it just looks like design, but it really isn't. It's a random mutation and natural selection. If you can't explain where those finely tuned, uh, those things that just seem to scream out design, if you can't explain where they come from, then atheism will have to, be go, have to go back to being intellectually unfulfilled. <laughs>
That's the real question. Well, uh, and, and, and I don't think that Gould's uh, mechanisms really answer that question. They can answer why an animal might be different, you know, have a yellow coat instead of a... Uh, uh, but they can't answer why the yellow coat seems to match the environment that is so much better. Um, and more importantly, they can't, they can't answer uh, why a complex, uh, you know, why the bombardier beetle has this thing that it can squirt stuff at with a whole bunch of different moving parts that it doesn't work until it's 99% complete. And has to do all this without leaving a fossil record. Yeah. And this is what I, uh, you have to have, odd, I mean, allopatric separation is, is not common. How are you going to get all these different animals, for one thing? Uh, and uh, how are you going to do all this if uh, you're moving back into population things, as Gould and Eldridge come to be moving again, uh, without leaving, uh, extremely rarely that you find any of these intermediates, and you've got to, you got to find a million species, uh, or count at least uh, for a million species, uh, that where you have to say, well, the only time they were preserved is when evolution was not going on. I mean, what a coincidence! I can't, I can't buy that one. Um, Nick has raised a good question. I'll provide a partial answer, not a complete answer, without being able to have. Uh, to Chardin's book here. The question, as I understand, is whether he was a predecessor and he came up with the idea of uh, evolution by jumps rather than evolution by gradualism. If you look at the history of evolution in modern science, uh, there's always been an anti-gradualistic uh, sentiment. And it's come under different names. I recall the term saltation evolution, which is another way of saying it's by quantum jumps rather than gradualism. Saltatory evolution. That was around in the uh, 30s. Um, and it was probably fostered by political feelings that uh, political change does not happen gradualistic, but by major uh, shifts and changes and they wanted to you know see that the whole nature of life is by jumps rather than gradualism so that was around as I recall at least through the 1930s mm -hmm. uh, then you had um, a gold G-O-L-D not Gould who uh, had the idea of a hopeful monster have you heard of that term that um, there was a dinosaur that maybe laid an egg and out hatched a bird and uh, <clears throat> it happened in one generation. In other words, evolution, all the, there were no intermediates and this uh, philosopher, he wasn't I think a paleontologist, suggested that uh, you could do it in one generation, all these intermediate gaps. And so his theory was la labeled the hopeful monster. It was ridiculed. And, and after that, gradualism kind of took over. And it was only Gould and Eldridge that r revived the idea that things are not gradualistic. One of the problems with, with that hopeful monster theory is that you actually have to have two hopeful monsters, a male right. and a female. That's and they right. have to be in the same general area, because otherwise you won't get where you need to go. And that was just too much, too, uh, too much defying of the of standard chance. In most cases, except for the Y chromosome. Uh, so I have a question, and then Nick, we want to hear your response. Um, my question is about this theory, this dictum that I get from my archaeologist friends. I often argue that there are big, big uh, missing parts of the geological column in terms of what should have been there if there is gradualism. And um, I also argue sometimes on archaeology that, well, we don't have this record, we don't have that. They always come back to me and say the uh, 
uh, absence of evidence is not the evidence for absence or vice versa. And how would you respond to that? I think your whole uh, presentation here on that chapter is dealing with um, the clear absence of evidence. You know, the burden is on those who say there's a long history, but they're almost using the archaeologist's argument this just give it enough time and we're going to come up with some answers. And um, is there a quick answer to that? <laughs> yes, uh, gradualism is very old, I agree. But the name punctuated equilibrium, I learned about it in the 60s. And that's why I wonder why Mayer is not giving credit to Thelard de Chardin. All you need to do is uh, do a Google search this afternoon, look up the term punctuated equilibrium uh, with Google, and it'll show you if it crops up in any books or even articles before, let's say, 1970s. I will do that. Uh, I was just going to comment on this question of sociology. Uh, rapid changes in sociology do not and should not be used as uh, examples of rapid evolution because sociological changes can take place instantly. Evolution Warren. takes Warren. millions of years. Well, I, I, there's one thing that, that, that I think probably should be pointed out, and that is that if there is change in human civilizations or sociology, if you, if you want to put it that way, uh, and there is rapid change because you can see in the American Southwest suddenly a whole civilization uh, with apartment buildings, it's towns that, you know, uh, just out of nowhere. Um, but if I can put it that way, that's intelligent design. And so if you're trying to use that as a parallel to explain biology, then you have to say, well, maybe there's some intelligent design involved there, too. Paul, can you definitively prove creation? No. <clears throat> okay, so we're dealing with <clears throat> two opposite belief systems, neither which can be proved. That's and true. If they suddenly find something I mean, not in China, but somewhere else that has these missing forms. Will you be swayed <coughs> toward evolution? I will be impressed and I will reevaluate. So you might tip? Well, well it, there, are, there are several other factors that you have to put in, <coughs> in, in, into it um, before you simply tip. <coughs> And uh, I, want you to, I want to point out to you that the Cambrian explosion is solidly against standard neo-Darwinism. It's solidly against <coughs> even punctuated equilibrium. And yet those people are not swayed. So that tells you that, that those evidences are not definitive depending on who you are. Now, there are some people for who would say, well, it's just not enough evidence. And you'll notice that one of the things he was pointing out is that some people will say, well, there's a Cambrian explosion on your side, but there's a tree of life on our side. And one of the reasons that he had the chapter, I think it's six, is to say, no, the tree of life isn't on your side. And God may give them the delusions that they need to really <laughs> Well, the, the text says that God gave them delusions so that they should believe a lie. Who received not the love of the truth? So if you really don't receive the love of the truth, you know, God may very well let you believe what you want to believe. And, and the, one, this is one of the reasons why when I'm discussing, I don't try to tell people, you know, you're wrong. And what's worse, what I hear some of my colleagues uh, say, you're wrong and you're going to burn in hell forever because of that. Uh, 
Yeah, it's, uh, my, my approach is, look, <coughs> you have a theory. I have a theory. In this area, my theory has more evidence behind it. And you know what? If you want to believe your theory anyway, it's a free country. It's a free universe. <coughs> God's given you that privilege. <coughs> you may find out you're wrong later on. <coughs> but I don't think that we have any business pushing people any, any harder than God does. Uh, good point. Um, uh, just a quick point, and I want to hear what you have to say. I racked my brain. It's not gold. It's Goldberg. Goldschmidt. Goldschmidt. Yeah. That's it. Goldschmidt yeah. was a geneticist, so he had he had uh, proper scientific creden credentials. Goldschmidt was the one. Richard Goldschmidt, if I yeah. remember correctly. Got yeah. He, uh, negative evidence is good. I want to argue that. It, if I was going to look at creation or evolution, I would predict that there would be no intermediates in the fossil record if that was creation, or there would be intermediates if it was evolution. I look at the fossil record, I don't find the intermediates there, and you can argue about some of these, but then uh, in general, that's a very solid statement. Uh, it's negative evidence, so to speak, but it fulfills the prediction. And I think this is good science. And uh, you look at that fossil record, it does not support evolution. Uh, you can say, okay, we're going to find some and so on. You know, uh, pretty, pretty remote that you're going to find intermediates for all these different things and we haven't found any so far at least the basic you know phyla of the Cambrian explosion uh, this is pretty remote uh, the data is definitely in favor of creation at least as far as what we know so far and it fulfills a prediction of science and th this is good science and this is the way the case is and I, I think uh, uh, we need not apologize for lack of evidence in this case. Negative evidence is good. It's good. Well, I think that negative evidence comes in, in different forms, okay? If you suspect somebody's been in your house and you walk in and um, you can't find them anywhere, then you go outside and you look for footprints and you don't find any footprints there. That's negative evidence. Now, if it's a bright sunny day and there's asphalt all over the place, it's not very good negative evidence because you don't expect most people to leave footprints in that kind of a situation. If a light snow has just fallen and you suspect that the person was in the house when you first walked in the door and they've hidden and they're trying to run away, then, if you don't ha can't find footprints, it's a whole lot stronger. And, I, and one of the things, that, uh, what people are doing when they argue in this situation is they are arguing about the strength of evidence as if there's a logical, if there's a logical possibility you can get away with it. Well, whenever, you, whenever you see people arguing about, that, well, there's a logical possibility it could have happened this way, then what you're looking at is actually somebody who's trying to maintain a, a position until it's logically impossible. And I'm sorry, science doesn't work that way. You know, uh, that's, that's what they're doing is they're, tr they're, trying to make, they're trying to make science into a metaphysical uh, certainty, and you can't do that with science. For all you know, they got away on a jetpack. It's not very likely, could have happened, you see. Whereas, you know, if nobody saw a jetpack leave either, well, it could have gone from the back of the house, you know. At, at some point, you've got to say, 
you know, we're going to draw kind of the obvious conclusion, maybe make it tentative, maybe make it so that we can reverse it if there's more evidence, but you, but you have to say, well, you know, we've looked pretty hard and there aren't any footprints, and under ordinary circumstances there should have been. I'd like to give a couple anecdotal stories to uh, validate what Ariel has just said. Um, I, I think absence of evidence should carry a lot of weight more than it does in, in and science. And especially if you're, if you're looking in that specific area exactly. and it's reasonable to find it. I know in solving crimes, a lot of times you don't find the evidence. And so you're willing to put things on a shelf sometimes for decades and sometimes the evidence does pop up years later. And so uh, really reconstructing the uh, paleontological record is much like crime solving. You're looking for who done it and how did they do it, what, how did it happen and when did it happen, timelines, all of this. But anyway, that's another subject. The anecdotal evidence is when I was a student in geology at Michigan State University, um, I took a class in invertebrate paleontology. Uh, the instructor was a young man, maybe 10 years older than a lot of the students. He had started out in the Roman Catholic priesthood, and he had actually gone a ways in training, he told us. He was not ashamed of this at all. And then he found he really loved geology, and he got his doctorate. And once we were talking about the history of life, and he was diagramming it on the board, and he was looking at where do things pop up in the geological record, you know, the birds in the Cretaceous, and the dinosaurs in the Triassic, or at least Jurassic back then. And then he was going back to the earliest phyla, and diagramming them as Cambrian, and then he came down to Precambrian, a big question mark. And he stuck, stuck, he stood back and he looked at his diagram. And he said, "Hmm, this looks like special creation." He used the term "special creation." He knew what that meant. And a lot of the class that was over their heads, but I knew. And then he said, "But of course, our our model or our theory doesn't fit that." So. And then I took a class uh, years later through a, a Smithsonian uh, curator and, and scientist, I.G. It wasn't Song. Richard Sternberg. N no. <laughs> okay. I don't have any famous person that I took a class from. I wish I did. Not, not like, uh, you know, Kurt Wise and Stephen Jay Gould. I don't, I don't have that claim to fame. But anyway, I.G. Sohn was probably one of the top 10 or top 20 invertebrate paleontologists back then, back in the 70s when I had a class from him. And um, he and I talked freely. And he said, when you go down to the Cambrian, in terms of invertebrates, you just don't have a fossil record before then anything with hard parts. And he said, my theory is that all of these groups started independent of each other. In other words, he said, I'm a polyphyleticist. In other words, phyla uh, originated separate, separately. Monophyletus would be Darwinist. And he said, my colleagues accuse me of being a creationist. And he was willing to talk openly about that. And so there's a, a big gulf. It's like these scientists come up to the edge of a precipice and they're looking over and they don't want to jump and so they back up. Yeah, no one. I, I talked to Dr. Sohn. He didn't have an explanation other than it just happened fast. Yeah. And I knew he was a Jewish believer. He yeah. believed in God. And As you I can knew. see, the... the um uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, he would love to be able to say, well, look, they came from this organism or that exactly. organism. But he's saying, they aren't there, and we believe that they were there anyway. Yeah. And that's, that's as much faith. And once you get that far, I think you've gone as far as you can. You do, and there's a precipice there. Yeah. I, I just heard on the radio uh, yesterday, there was a program on some guy talking about the uh, some 
some skull that was found, you know, uh, as if it was, you know, a missing link. It's, it's just so, you know, crazy. Once you find out about these things, you know, they're, you know what they're doing. You know, they find uh, an ancient uh, monkey skull, you know, had very small brain cavity, and uh, which he did mention that. So, extremely small brain. So, anyway, but uh, that was kind of weird being a after coming to the, all these classes, it's, it's very strange to hear this same old rhetoric that should be passed away many years ago, especially, but now it's just, it's just to the level of ridiculousness. But I was going to make a comment about the, um, you know, if you're looking at information, like you're talking about loving the truth, well, a, part, a big part of being objective, say, if you want to find the truth and not be deluded your whole life, perhaps, you need to look at things uh, unbiasedly. And we all have so certain bias, so we have to realize that too and maybe go a little bit beyond what we think is uh, fair. Try well, yeah, that's what I just said. <laughs> Are you listening? Well, <laughs> and I agree anyway. with you. Um, you know. uh, nobody's unbiased. I'm not unbiased. Ariel Roth is not unbiased. The best we can do is try to try to accommodate the biases as well as recognize them first, and try to you know work against them as much as we can, and be honest with what we see. Well, we can we can use our imaginations too a little bit here. You know, we can we can look if we if we know nothing about anything. How would this appear? Just, you know, do a hyper hypothetical. Uh, and I think sometimes there's one other thing that we should do. Uh, I highly recommend it because I think I've done some of it and it's turned out very well. Uh, and that is, if you run into an area where your theory conflicts with what everybody else is saying is supposed to be there, it's probably worthwhile to back up and ask, are they really seeing what they think they're seeing? Is, should your theory be tweaked to account for that? And if so, what side effects will that have on your theory, and can we test that? Right. Uh, in, in, the case of, uh, in the case of carbon-14 dating, that's exactly what I try to do. And in fact, you can read the, uh, the, the evolution of that particular thing coming through First, the, the book that I wrote, and then the, the first article that I wrote, which says, here's the theories that you should run into, you know, the, the theoretical differences that there are. And then, and then the second article that I wrote on carbon-14 and very old material. And now an article on the bones from the city of Nineveh that seems to indicate that one of the other differences that I predicted might be there uh, looks like it's panning out. Uh, I don't think we should stop there. I think we have more data on both, uh, both of those fronts and on the third front that I suggested we should be looking for, I think should also be looked at. Uh, but I think that that's the best cure for, for being biased is to start saying, well, if my theory is true, I should find this and then go to see, not try to find it, but go to see whether it is true. There's a big difference between those two. Well, that might be kind of a lot of work, it sounds like. Well, <laughs> it all depends on how badly you want to know truth. That's, what I, that's kind of what I'm getting at, too. <laughs> is if you love the truth, just like you love your kids or something else, you're going to do, you're going to do the work necessary. If you don't, you know, you're just going to spend as little time as possible. And just like what you pay for, you're going to get what yeah. you pay for. Yeah. And I think that's where Darwin failed. He says... How the eyes work amazed me, and I have no explanation for it. There's a quote to Darwin said so. I do not know how that. Well, I think the man uh, was a theology student, as I understand, um, and he had Bible with him as he went on the tour, on the trip. Um, how the skin works? We have 100 trillion cells in our bodies, all work together as a team. How, why didn't you uh, wonder about how the brain works or the heart? Today you mentioned uh, Stephen Hawkins, and he says, 
I'm amazed that if I understood right, uh, it says the heart, the human heart, the human eye, the human brain, how human kidneys, how they work. That was Dawkins, yeah. Dawkins, right. I mean, why this is, uh, he's perhaps the most intelligent man on earth today. Why doesn't he ask why and, and go details, more into details, how could this come about? And that would perhaps take him to the truth. It can, it can. But if you know that one answer cannot possibly be true, and that's the real answer, you will never get there. And I think when we discuss this kind of thing with people, we're going to have to wait till God overwhelms them with their evidence. Unfortunately, by then it may be too late for, for character development, but, you know, that's, that's life. Um, but, you know, once we point out that, look, I have this evidence on my side, you don't have the, uh, that evidence on, on your side, um, And, uh, and, you know, if you want to believe it, I'm not going to challenge your, your faith. Just as long as it's clear that it's faith against the evidence, that's, what, that's all we can do. That's all we can do. <laughs> well, unfortunately, this is state-sponsored religion. You, you and I know that, and taxpayers' money goes there. Two million teachers in this country. Uh, it's sad, and uh, that's why I feel Today, what the preacher says is perhaps the best sermon I've ever heard <laughs> in the last 10 years. <laughs> We've got to take responsibility as a, as a church, as individuals. Um, seek ye first the kingdom of God. You know, work out your salvation with trembling. Uh, uh, it's our personal responsibility, and unfortunately, we have that's a duty. not taught anymore. We have a duty. And the we duty have a duty. We absolutely have a duty. It doesn't go with feelings. No. And... It doesn't look for pats on the back, which is another way of going for feelings. Very true. That the, the fact of the matter is the truth is what really matters. Yes. Anyway, next week we'll work on uh, the second part. I may take it a little slower because it looks like it's hard to get through two chapters at once for some of this. We will see.